Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. This is Voice Over Denise real quick chiming in to let you know that there is an Etsy shop restock. There are lots of new matte stickers and zipper bags waiting to go home with you. While supplies last, most glossy stickers and retiring prints are 10% off. There's a link in the description below and now back to today's video. Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be trying something a little bit different or really really old depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, today we're going to be recording, well I'm recording a live video, it's pre-recorded for you but I'm doing it on the camera instead of doing a voiceover like I normally do these days. I used to do these types of videos a lot and as my channel has grown I have gone away from that and do more produced videos, but a lot of you have been asking for this style of content. You've been asking for some more Swatch With Me videos, so we're going to see if that's actually what you want. So if you do enjoy this video throughout the course of the video, make sure you're commenting or liking or sharing or all that stuff to let me know that you're enjoying this, um, and we'll see how it goes. Today we're going to be taking a look at some very special paints that just arrived in the mail. I wasn't planning on doing three stone ground videos in a row. Um, I was planning on doing the two, the watercolors that I've been using for years. I love them and I was very confident showing them to you. Today is going to be something a little bit different. Um, stone ground very kindly sent me a very generous gift of their entire gouache line. So we're going to be swatching that out today. It arrived in three different tins. So let me go ahead and open those for you real quick. All right, that should be a better look for you. Um, I am in awe, honestly. After I did those last videos, um, Jenny wrote to me and offered to send these to me. And I mean, I had already been looking at the gouache. I'd had it in my cart. I was trying to wait until taxes were paid before I made any other big purchases. And I am incredibly, incredibly grateful that I get to take a look at these. So um, they literally arrived earlier today um, and we're going to go ahead and swatch them. It took well over an hour to make these two sheets, maybe more like an hour and a half. I have all the names written now. I know it's a little bit complicated, but you'll see once we start swatching. There are 64 colors here and we're going to be doing some opacity tests and then some other things. Uh, as you probably know, most of you maybe, I don't know, gouache is usually used straight from the tube to be its most creamy and um, opaque, uh, but some companies also sell half pans or full pans of them, and Stone Ground is a handmade company, so theirs come in half pans. I assume that's easier for them to do. And that means that they might be a little less opaque than maybe we're used to seeing, but you do all know how much I love my opaque watercolor. So even if they're not as opaque as gouache, I still think they could be really fun to use. So I am excited to take a look. My swatch sheets are arches, watercolor paper. I debated doing it on different paper, smooth paper. Um, I don't always need to use like a high quality cotton paper when I'm using gouache. However, I do all of my swatching on arches for the rest of the channel, so I figured we'd be consistent. I'm using a tiny little skinny tape to separate our boxes so it's nice clean lines after the video is done. Um, and I've also, I don't normally do opacity tests because it's not a huge concern for me with watercolors these days, but because these are gouache, I did put these um, Sharpie marks on all of the, the boxes so that you can see how opaque uh, each color is. And then I also have a secondary box for all of them that will do more like a graded watercolor wash that I'm used to showing you all. Um, and that's the plan. That's the plan today. Hopefully we can get through it um, without taking too terribly long. I'm going to be using a different brush than I would use with watercolors. I really enjoy using these silver white uh, brushes, bright is the shape of it. It's like a shorter, flat wash brush. Jenny Granberry introduced me to these, of course, um, and this is a size 10. I'll link all the things that I mentioned in the description below so that you can take a look. Let me rearrange my setup here and we'll get started. 
All right, so this is very much a first impressions look. I've obviously not swatched any of these before. I've never used them before. And um, we're gonna see how it goes. I have written down all the pigment information that I have. I also have a water bottle. I don't normally miss down my watercolors first, but since we're working with gouache and the more um, creamy it is, the better. I'm going to go ahead and spritz these down. All right, they are touching each other a little bit, so we might have some bleeding, but oh well. The reason I don't tend to uh, water, put water on my watercolors is because of the metal on the tin. I don't like to add extra water if I don't have to, to just avoid um, any kind of rusting or whatnot. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll give it a shot for this time around. I'm going to leave us zoomed out for the first couple swatches so that you can see how they re-wet and how we're putting them down on the paper. But after that, I'll zoom in so you can see the actual swatches a little bit better. Uh, for those of you who are not patrons of mine, um, I'll just run by this real quick. I, am, I have this set up not how I would normally paint. I'm right-handed, so normally I'd have my paint on the right side. However, if I do that and I have my paints over here, my hand blocks your view underneath where I'm painting. So uh, I've had them switched around. It means I will have to reach across to get to the water and the paints, but I won't be on top of the swatches as we do that. So if you're a patron, you already know that. That's how we do our tutorials and everything, but I just wanted to give you a little note in case you weren't used to seeing that. So our first color that we're going to be swatching is Daffodil. This is a PW65 and PW, I'm sorry, PY65 and PW6. We're going to start right over the top of this swatch here. And you know, I told myself, the way I swatched this off, I have this extra column here. I was like, you should put that on the left hand side so that you can you know, hold on to something while you're swatching. And also I wouldn't have this issue of running off the page, but alas, I did not do that. I forgot. And then I wanted to be consistent. So both pages are like that, <laughs> but oh, well, I can clean up any of this paint that gets on my desk by just wiping it away. So I'm not going to go too crazy to ham on that maybe I'll do like a secondary stripe um, after this video. Like I'll put another swatch on that and put those on Patreon. I always have a companion post to my YouTube videos over on Patreon with high resolution scans if you're interested in that. Um, oh, I already forgot what I was doing. <laughs> I reached into the next color, which is Hansa Yellow Light. I don't want to waste paint, so I'm going to put this down, but then we're going to backtrack back over to our daffodil. My apologies. I haven't done a video like this in a very long time and I am not used to not being able to do takesy backsies with uh, my editing. <laughs> uh, Hansa Yellow Light is made from PY3. This is a much more transparent pigment and there's no white in it to kind of anchor it and give it that opacity. That's very normal in gouache uh, for these yellow pigments not to be as opaque. Um, I'm trying not to water this down too much, just enough to kind of flow. I'll come back in here and do another pass. And then while I still have this color on my brush, we're going to do more of the graded wash over here. So starting with the strong tint at the top, and then we will water it down as we get towards the bottom. There's cat hair everywhere, cat, cat hair abound. <laughs> it was stuck to the edge of the tape, so it's just going to be part of our life here. And I do apologize for that, but it is the way it is. I mean, I'm sure you already saw by the length of this video that we're going to be here for a while. So I do encourage you to grab a snack or a beverage, maybe grab your sketchbooks. You could do some swatching, you could do some sketching. 
and just hang out with me for a bit. Going back to the daffodil, putting down our opaque layer of paint at the top and then rinsing my brush and pulling that down through so that we can get a nice even gradient. This color reminds me a lot of like a, um, oh, what am I thinking of? Like a, a nickel titan at yellow, I believe. It's really soft, really lovely. Um, I just, I, I'm really liking that. Oh, I didn't um, say I use a new pen for the uh, writing. It is, hold on. It is this Uniball Air Pen that was in one of Tio's recent videos. I'll link that down below. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with it. It's a beautiful pen. For the most part, it dries really well and then doesn't smear, but it looks like when I went back to overactivate this one, it smeared a little bit. So that's probably my fault for not letting it dry uh, long enough, but just wanted to let you know what that was. Going into our next color. This is going to be Hansa Yellow made from PY74. Now, um, in gouache, especially in designer's gouache, where the, the goal is to make a piece of artwork, scan it, and then sell prints or replications of that work, light fastness is not of the most important quality to, I forgot we weren't doing a graded wash, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll get it eventually where, you know, we're three colors into 64, but so in designer squash, the, the goal is to replicate the work. So you want bright, beautiful colors that scan really well. And that are kind of like in the, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow printer spectrum situation. My whole point with this <laughs> is that I'm saying some of these colors are not going to be light fast and that's to be expected. Um, and just be aware of that if you are someone who sells your artwork that when you're using gouache in general, uh, you need to make sure you're checking those light fastness ratings and just let your, let your customers know about it. It doesn't mean you can't use them. It just means that you should be honest about the quality of your work and how long they would be expected to last if they are in uncertain circumstances like hanging in front of a window, which you should never do anyway. You should always hang it or it's going to be protected from the sun. All of that to say, PY74 is not the most light fast pigment, but it's not the worst either. And uh, it's just good to be aware of that. This is a beautiful like middle yellow. Very, very pretty. You can see that pen is bleeding again. You know, I wrote these out a while ago. I did this whole sheet and then I did the other whole sheet. So it took a, a while and I'm kind of surprised. Kind of surprised they're not dry, but I will try and do better about not going over that area more than once with the wet brush and hopefully that'll help. Next we have PY65. This is going to be our warm yellow and this is a very common color for Hansa Yellow Deep. No surprises here. What I really want to do with these paints obviously is paint with them, but it is nice for me to do swatches first, not only to share them with you, but also this is a lot of paints, 64 colors is a lot of colors. And I would love to know kind of how they handle before I get into that. So, um, I wanted to take the effort or wanted to make the effort to, Um, go through them with you first. I'm trying to get this to lay a little bit thicker over the black, but I think that's about as good as we're going to get. We're going to take that heavy saturation. Oops, just stuck my finger in the paint while I was looking at the camera. Excellent and normal. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hopefully, um, you know, swatching videos have been around for a while. It's been a long time, obviously, since I've done a live one here. Um, 
And if, if you're coming across this as one of your first, just know that swatching is very, very helpful. Um, it's a great tool, but it's not the end all and be all of painting. Um, your paints aren't necessarily going to handle the same line of painting as they do on a very simple swatch card like this. So it's just, a, it's a time to get acquainted with our paints, but just because a color looks great here doesn't mean it will look great in a painting and vice versa. Like some colors may not wow us here, but they might end up being really useful colors. So let me zoom you in. We'll keep going. I am so bummed that the ink is running. I had done test pages of this and um, really thought it would be fine. And you can see with the thicker washes with less water, it doesn't happen as easily. But when we get lots of water in there, it just reactivates the ink. So again, I'll try and do my best. All right, next color is Orchard Peach. This is going to be another pigment with white in it. We've got PY139 and PW6. Um, PY139 is the yellow I decided to keep on my main stone ground palette as like my warm yellow. Um, it's a really, really beautiful color. Um, it's newer. There isn't as, as many providers of this color, um, but I really, really like it. And it's fun that they made a little pastel version out of it. It's even more red than I would expect it to be. It is a very intense kind of like orangey yellow, but it's really nice to see this nice peachy color. Do this quickly and get out so that we don't disturb that ink. Next we have India Yellow, which is that PY139 on its own. So we whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> another reason why I do of voiceovers. I can't talk in normal sentences anymore. It's fine. Uh, this is the PY139 by itself. So you can see that really rich kind of craft macaroni and cheese type of color. I would say that you could either use this or the PY65. You don't need both. They're very, very similar. Um, and it just depends if you want something a little closer to orange or a little bit closer to yellow. Finally learned how to paint a gradient wash, everyone. It only took me six tries <laughs> to do as quickly as possible. You know, it's, it's, I haven't painted in a couple days. It's fine. Next, we're going to be using some pyro orange. This is another color that is commonly available in watercolors PO73. This is a vividly bright orange. I'm going to give another little spritz to our palette. Just keep things moving. This is, I mean, this is kind of like a scarlet red. It's very, very intense. It's a very orange, orange. This is more what we're used to seeing. Just slightly watered down. We can get it more to that watercolor hue we're used to seeing, but it's still very vivid and bright. I wonder if I should have painted this whole second square in like just a tint, but I, I think it's good to see the whole value range. Let me know what you think. 
in case I do another video like this in the future with, with gouache company. I don't feel the need to do, I know, I know a lot of people still do them and it's helpful information, especially, um, if you're concerned with the color being transparent, but ever since I stopped caring whether or not my watercolors were transparent, I just haven't bothered to do opacity tests. Um, I have a pretty good feel for the way that they handle, um, and like everything, you know, these opacity tests are tools that help us get to know our paints. So do what works for you. I love this color. Holy cow. This is made from PY65, PR170. And I put a little note here. Um, this is the first color that I had used with three pigments. So in the order that it lists on the website, which I assume is how like much of each kind is in it, we had PY65 first, PR172 second, and then PW6 third. So um, uh, in the future rows, I will put them in order, but in this one, the PW6 should be last. And I didn't do that because I didn't have enough room. <laughs> Uh, but it's definitely a salmon peachy orange type of color. Can't wait to use this in like a sketchbook spread. It's going to be great. And um, as we tint this out, you can really see that yellow coming through. Try not to go over that pen too much. And I'm going to move you down again. Next we have Azo Orange, and I didn't look this pigment up yet, but it is a new one for me. I'm gonna guess it's not light fast since we, I haven't seen it in watercolors before, but this Azo Orange is made out of P05, and look at how intense this color is for you orange lovers or warm red lovers. Holy camoli. That's a fun color. And if we're, you know, if we're focused on making really cool artwork and then replicating it by scanning it in, or maybe it just lives in your sketchbook and doesn't see the sun, that's absolutely fine too. I am kind of blown away. That's an intense orange that, you know what? I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to have fun painting with it. <laughs> Uh, a lot of you know orange is not my favorite. Granted, this is closer to red than to orange, but what a fun color. I think I see some granulation in there. It'll be interesting to see how that dries. Oh, I just flung orange palette into my purples and blues, so that's great. But next we have Brilliant Orange, um, and this seems to be a less intense. Like I might have arranged this in a different order. Maybe I would have put Chinook Salmon first, and then Pyral Orange, and then Brilliant Orange, and then Azo Orange, like if I was doing it in chromatic order, but tis fine. Where am I? I'll probably cut that out and you won't even hear it. <laughs> I I did a whoops there for a second, just confusing myself over nothing. But here we have Brilliant Orange. PO36 is another color that uh, I have learned recently is not as light fast as maybe we hoped when it first hit the market. Um, but it is a really beautiful color. Uh, very, for me, it feels like a very late summer, early fall type of vibe. Um, doesn't quite have the, how do I want to put this? It's more, it's, <laughs> I can't make words. Uh, it's still obviously a really intense, like a, a super, what just happened with my brush? Oh my goodness. It's obviously a very, um, bold orange, but it's more, kind of burnt and natural looking than the pyro orange or the azo orange where those are like really clearly um 
they feel like man-made colors. Um, this one is a little bit softer. Not a ton softer, but a little bit softer. Okay, then we have Vermilion, which is made from PR188. This is another color that we do see in watercolors reasonably often. It's going to be another one of our orangey reds. I was really surprised by how many like red oranges are in this line. So I would love to hear from all of you what you think about that. Is that something that you like to have that nuance with all these different hues? Um, which one's your favorite? And uh, hopefully I can get my camera to color calibrate properly so you can see what they really look like. I'll know when I edit this video. <laughs> I keep looking up at the camera to make sure that I, you know, am recording and on screen. And every time I do that, I hit my palette in a funky way and, and mess something up. <laughs> okay, there's our graded swatch. And one more for this row. We've got Naphthal Red, which is PR170. I can't remember if I said it earlier because it was in our earlier mix. This is not a light, fast color, um, but again, the goal is not light fastness. It is having these beautiful, bold colors that we can reproduce. I'll stop saying that because I'm sure you're tired of hearing me say it. <laughs> it's going to be, you know, we still, we're not even a quarter of the way through this video. So for being honest, I might have forgotten how to talk to the camera. That's why I make scripts. <laughs> Having a hard time believing it's April already. Don't really know how that happened. But here we are. It's going to be the beginning of summer before we know it. But I'm gonna try and enjoy these spring days for as long as I can before it gets too toasty. Next, we have Rose Garden. Um, I didn't look up, again, this is a lot of paint and it's all pretty new to me and just arrived. I had been looking at a few colors ahead of time, but I don't know every color story. I don't know who Rose is. Uh, W-R, no, R-O-W-E apostrophe S. Um, so Rose Garden, not I, I see that it's a, a fun play on a word there when I say it out loud, but uh, not R-O-S-E, but it does look like a very rosy pink. I like this one too. I'm finding with gouache and with opaque medium I'm having so much fun working with kind of these pastel colors I'm also just in kind of a pastel vibe in life not in art but just in life um I used to love the color pink when I was a, a child a very small child my first room like was a baby pink color and I grew out of that and never looked back until very very recently and in the last I would say three or four years, I've really come around probably like three years. I want to say early pandemic days. I've just felt like this need to be <laughs> cradled by this very sweet, gentle pink with the, the gentle pink vibes. And, you know, it reminds me of rose quartz and roses and just softness and gentle. And I'm just, I'm, I'm in a pink phase again. It took 36 years to come back around to it, but we, we came back. I guess that's not true. I uh, was older than that when I grew out of the pink phase. Okay, I'm gonna turn my palette just to make sure that I'm grabbing the right colors. So it might look a little funky on your screen. Next we have Winter Radish, and I do apologize. I didn't have enough room to write all these names fully out, so I'll make sure I say them out loud. That way you have an easy time finding them on Stone Ground's website. 
You can also, um, again, on Patreon, I'll put the scans in there so you can take a nice long look at everything if that is something you're interested in. So this color, I'm trying to form my thoughts about it. Um, it's made with PR-170 and PR-122, so it's that Napthal Red and a Quinacridone Magenta. It's a very rich, I don't know, I don't know what a winter radish looks like, but it reminds me a lot of like a Christmas red. This is a really pretty deep, hearty Christmas red. <laughs> That's how I'd put that. When we tint it out, we can see a lot more of that pink undertone from the PR-122. I feel like I did not do a great gradient there, so I want to make sure that's not on me to represent color poorly. I'll try and smooth it back out. And next we have rhubarb pie, which is a fun one. Oh, 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 we slipped out of our, our spot there. This is made with PR254 and PB29. So that's going to be your pyrrole red and your ultramarine blue. And this is way uh, more bricky colored than I would expect from those two pigments, but what a fun color. Um, can't say that I've eaten a lot of rhubarb pie over the years, so I don't know how accurate this is to the pie, but it's a very cool color. Let's, I want to say it like, it has orange undertones, but that's not factually correct. <laughs> PR254 is a pretty middle red. And obviously, PB29 is an ultramarine, so I would expect this to be a little closer to a violet. I'm not saying that those colors make a clean violet. Sorry, I'll try and cut that out. I um, Whenever I hit a metal tin, this camera picks it up really, really heavily, which is another reason why I stopped recording live voiceovers is because it's much easier to modulate the audio if I do it after the fact. But anyway, I was just saying that um, this is obviously much more red than it is blue, but I still am really surprised by that pairing. It's very interesting. All right, unless I wrote something down wrong. Maybe I wrote something down wrong, but exciting. All right, next we have Saskatoon Berry, and I can already tell you I love this color. It is so pretty. I love warm violets, like in life in general. They are beautiful, and this is a very, like, rich berry color, as the name promises. This is made from PB36, PB19, and PR170. So um, it's going to be either your cerulean, or we know in this line we also have like that Tyrian purple. So I don't know if that is involved. Um, then we have a quinacridone rose or quinacridone magenta and a napthal red. Now I do have a more difficult time painting with this particular hue in the type of painting that I do with uh, natural subjects in natural colors. I mean, sometimes I do my whimsical colors, but this is one that's a little harder to incorporate just because it's such a pow color, but it's one of my favorite hues on its own. It's so beautiful. 
Next we have Antique Rose, which is going to be that PR170 again. I see this in a lot of gouache lines, um, so it must be a really uh, good mixing color, like in terms of formulas. It's my guess anyway. Um, and or it's affordable, one or the other, or both. Um, this is just going to be that red mixed with titanium gray. And if you watched my previous videos on Stonegrounds line, um, they have this beautiful titanium gray that we're going to take a look at later that it's just so beautiful. So that's what is in this pigment. Look at, like, you can barely even see the name on this one. It'll dry more transparent, but that is beautimous. I can definitely see the antique rose vibes. Great naming convention there. We have a couple uh, more flowers coming up. So hopefully you are enjoying the floral theme. Next is Water Lily, which is an incredibly pale lavender, it looks like. Um, it's mostly, maybe, okay, maybe I was wrong earlier when I said like this color up here, I said I the PW6 was listed last. Maybe PW6 is just always listed last because this has to be mostly white. Um, this is a very lightly pigmented paint. Um, but it also has, but it also has, um, ultramarine pink in it. That's the PR 259. Well, I guess PR 259 is a really weak tinting strength. So maybe there's more of that. I don't know. It's just, it's a very light color. <laughs> I treat paint recipes like uh, like food ingredients, and maybe I shouldn't do that. And food ingredients, I'm so used to the, the ingredients being listed from most prevalent to least prevalent. And I guess that isn't a strict requirement of paint companies, so I shouldn't assume. I'm not sure what I personally would use this for. However, I could see it being really useful in like a, a floral painter's palette. It's probably pretty handy. Next is Apple Blossom, which is going to be um, a very similar color, but more of that ultramarine pink. So you can see both of these have the same pigments in them with different ratios. So I'm going to assume that this one has more white, this one has more of the pink, and should be pretty apparent when you see them side by side. This does remind me a lot of just uh, what PR259 looks like, except an opaque version, which is great. That's what I would expect to see. Uh, PR259 is a very weak tinting strength, as I mentioned, so um, you probably need to use more of this in mixes, but we're not going to be doing mixing today because A, I don't know that I would do a ton of mixing with a gouache palette um, with the number of convenience colors that are in here. So that's to say, um, because they're not fresh from the tube and they're going to be like, they're going to require more water to get them into a mixing consistency anyway. And we don't want to add too much water to them in most cases with gouache. Um, and because there's so many convenient colors that I would probably just pick a, a color that was closer, but 
doesn't mean we can't mix it. Doesn't mean that's not an option. Our next color is going to be Sweet Pea, which brings me back to Bath and Body Works in the late 90s, early 2000s. <laughs> And this is going to be, I would say more, I think I called this lavender at some point, but this is definitely more pinky and this is more of a bluish toned lavender. Just to try and correct myself. I don't know what I said, but you can see that. They are um, different tints of different shades of purple. Next is Iris, which is made from Dioxazine Violet, PV23, and PW6. Really um, lending itself well to floral painters. Yeah, this is a, this is a really nice cooler purple, uh, and that white helps ground it in gouache so that it's more opaque because PV23 is Generally a pretty transparent color, dark, but transparent. We still can't see the name under this one. <laughs> Maybe it's just that opaque. It's lost forever. I did debate for a very long time if I should put the black strip with the mass tone paint over the pigment number or over the name and I figured it's more of a hassle to look up the pigment numbers than the names. The names are on all the sides of the pans. And I do love that stone ground. Let's see if I can show you real quick after the swatch. Stone ground does orient their labels so that you can see them all from the inside so that you don't have to rewrite them on there. So. I thought that it would be easier to cover up the names if necessary because I can find where that is on the palette and then um, don't have to go to their website to look up pigment information. Next we have Tyrian Cobalt Purple. Oh man, oh ooh, interesting. Not this color, but a color coming up I'll show you when we get closer. Tyrian Cobalt Purple is one of my favorite colors in their watercolor line. It is... Um, a very special hue of cerulean blue pb36 it's definitely like it's got the purple vibes going on so pretty I messed up the swatch. This is my fault. I'm trying to make it dry smooth again so that it doesn't look bad as we look back on our whole sheet. Okay. Our next color, still not the color I was making weird noises at, um, but the next color we have is Delft Cobalt Blue, which is another PB36 that I was absolutely smitten over in our last two videos. Um, I do want to put a little asterisk in here that 
I have not talked to Jenny about this color specifically. Uh, I haven't had a chance to yet. One of my patrons did message me and let me know that they are sold out. And when she contacted them about that, they said that they, they don't know if it'll be back in stock due to a supply um, situation. So I am so sorry for gawking over it and thinking, like telling y'all how lovely it was in the last couple videos and it's not available at the moment. And I'm not sure if it will be back in stock, but Hopefully you can still appreciate how beautiful this color is. I'm going to try and waste as little as possible. So I have as much to enjoy. Um, I can show you this one. I lift up the palette in a second. The what I, I might not mention it since it's, you know, I didn't hear directly from Jenny, but the pan in this set is half full, which means that they <laughs> I'm losing my words, everyone. Um, when handmade paint makers fill their pans, if you haven't seen all the beautiful videos on YouTube and Instagram, um, they usually fill them up and then we'll let that dry and then we'll fill them up again. So my, my guess, this is only a guess and I don't want to spread rumors, is that they had enough to, you know, make this first batch. They ran out, couldn't get the new supply, and now I have this little half filled pan here, which is totally fine by me. I'm very grateful to have some of the last little bit of that. Um, what I was making faces at, let me see if I can focus it. I don't want to tilt this too far. Our next color is Starry Night and it's kind of bubbling up out of the half pan. I don't, I don't think you can see that super, super well and I don't want to totally dump these <laughs> paints out, but I, I was just like, oh, the water made it expand. So hopefully Hopefully uh, my battery lasts a little bit longer. Um, it is threatening to die on me, but I'd at least like to finish this row, maybe even the page before I address that, but we'll see. Anyway, Starry Night is made from PB27, which is Prussian blue and PBK11, which is their iron oxide black. It's going to be a beautiful hue. And you know, since we don't care about light fastness, we can actually enjoy the wonders that are Prussian blue because Prussian blue is gorgeous and it's not on my main watercolor palette because of its light fastness situation. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Prussian blue is kind of reputed as light fast by pretty much every company. Um, however, it will fade in the sun and then if you put it in a closet for a while or like in a dark space, it will restore its color, which is real weird. Uh, not typical of how <laughs> most fading works. Um, but because of that, because I sell my work, uh, sometimes I don't keep it all on my palettes just so that I don't have to worry about that. But it is a really beautiful hue. It is more on the transparent side. So this is a pretty transparent color for our gouache. It's very dark though. So it might look a bit more opaque on that left hand swatch there. You can see kind of these blue green undertones. I'm pretty blown away by the opacity of these colors in particular. There's just like you can't you can barely see what's underneath them. And that's coming from, you know, dried half pans that it's harder to work up that opacity. So very impressive. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and check my camera's battery and switch over to the new palette. We're done with the first palette here, except I just noticed that there was red in my yellow. Okay, I went ahead and separated my half pans before I'm gonna spritz them down so that we won't have to worry about them getting stuck together. Should have done that before the first one. And we're moving on to ultramarine blue. So ultramarine blue is a color that isn't super opaque in watercolors. It is granulating, so it's got a bit of opacity to it, but nowhere near like a cobalt blue um, or cerulean or cobalt teal. So I don't think this is gonna be a very opaque color, but it does give us kind of that 
primary blue, like primary school blue that we're used to from all of that uh, early childhood stuff, it also is going to be helpful in mixing our dark colors if you wanted to use it in a similar way as watercolor. Yeah, I do think it's our only, it's our only like dark middle blue. Uh, interestingly enough, um, well, no, actually that makes sense. Okay, I was going to say there is an phthalo blue, uh, but it's in a lot of the mixes that I saw when I was writing pigment numbers, but phthalo blue is even more transparent than um, ultramarine is, so they probably didn't use it for that reason, but they do have it mixed like with white um, in, in other colors, so it's probably what happened there. Yeah, this is, I think this is the least opaque color we've seen so far. Again, that's fine. Some pigments are just naturally less opaque, but it's good to know. Next we have Blue J, which is made from Phthalo Blue, Ultramarine, and White. So this is going to be our lighter kind of cyan type of color for mixing. This one is more opaque. And definitely looks like a Blue J. I'm really impressed with their naming conventions. I don't always love cutesy names for paints. Um, sometimes it's just helpful to know what the color is. But again, with so many mixes being gouache and having these convenience colors, it's absolutely uh, necessary for them to make up names for those because they don't have names when they're combination colors. <laughs> um, and the colors that are the names that they chose for the colors are like really uh, it, like the color that you get from them is what you would expect based on the color name. So that is very handy. Oh, I'm almost off screen. Luckily, not quite. Next, we have Bluebell Wood, which I just was complimenting on their colors. This one is a little confusing to me, but I would love to hear from the Canadians uh, in here if this is a specific... I'm used to, uh, having lived in Texas for three years, I'm used to the blue bonnets, blue bonnets that they get there? I think that's what they're called. And I know that there are flowers called bluebells, but I don't know what wood has to do with those things. So let me know. You don't have to be Canadian to let me know if you know the answer to that. Um, it's this very soft, I would call it like a cornflower blue. That's what I know this color as. And you know that whole little segment I just, just said in there, that whole thing would have cut it out if I had pre-recorded it. <laughs> Unnecessary rambling. Anyway, it is akin to the pastels up here, so akin to our pastel purple and pink. Would go very well next to those. Very opaque color. Really having to dilute it to make sure we can see a nice gradient. And it looks like our ink is finally more dry, so. All right, next we have Azure Blue, which is, again, uh, our phthalo blue mixed with white. This is going to be a really cool pastel blue. Um, this would be akin to what most Americans, at least, would call a baby blue. No! Put it in the wrong spot. <laughs> um, 
let me quickly soften this off so that we don't have a whole opaque swatch here. Okay, we can finish our opaque swatch. This is a powerful color, y'all. Okay, there we go. So you really do have your option of these pastels from, you know, pale pink, pink, purple, darker purple, blue, cool, cooler tones. Um, so if you love those pastel colors, uh, you're gonna love what keeps coming because there's a lot more of them. And in my opinion, one of my favorite um, kind of ranges of hues in handmade gouache lines or handmade watercolors are the colors coming up. Um, we don't get to see them very often because again, you know, they're not essential to have, but the pastel greens are so pretty to me and it might just be my soft girl phase I'm going through, but I'm definitely going to want a palette of these that is uh, more made up of the pastel colors so I can play with those some more because it's going to be fun. Uh, this is Cobalt Aquamarine. It is our Cobalt Teal color made from PB36. Uh, very similar to their line of watercolors and similar to other cobalt teals you'll see in other brands. Uh, this is a little bit more on the blue side of cobalt teal in case you were wondering for comparison. Next we have Blue Spruce, which was on my short list of colors that I wanted to purchase from them. So I'm really excited to give it a try. It's this beautiful blue gray color um, made from Phthalo Blue and that titanium gray showing up again. So you can really see how that muted gray uh, interacts with other colors. I was saying in think my last video that it's a really helpful mixing color, the titanium gray, um, because it makes these really moody pastel colors versus if you used a clean titanium white, you would have more um, of like a bright crisp color that we kind of see in these other ranges up here. And I am just digging these grayish pastel colors. They're so pretty. I'm honestly, I'm pretty impressed with how opaque a lot of these colors are. Um, I was expecting to see more transparent colors given that they're dried half pans and that's just not the case. They are very opaque and I'm enjoying this swatching time. Next we have Glacier Lake. This is going to be a pastel um, kind of green, bluish green type of color. It's made from PG7, which is Thalo Green Blue Shade, and PW6. Our next color is also going to be made with those two pigments, but they're different ratios. So we'll get to see how those compare. They look pretty similar in the pan next to each other. One is a tiny bit lighter than the other, but... I'll, I'll be excited to see those swatched out. All 
right. And then the one that looks similar to it in the pan is Aurora Green, also using uh, PG7 and PW6. We can see there's a little bit more white in this version. And I think, oh no, okay. There is one more um, pastel green, but it's made with the other phthalo green uh, yellow shade. So we'll get to see that one as well. I would call this more uh, akin to like a sea foam green. And this is closer to maybe, I almost want to say mint, but I think people might associate this color more with mint, even though mint leaves are not that color. Um, <laughs> I feel like this is more sea foam and this one is a little bit more pastel blue green. I don't know if that's helpful, but hopefully my words make sense. Oh my goodness. All the cat hair. Oh my goodness, we're all only halfway done. I understand I'm painting two swatches for every color, but I did hope this was gonna go a little quicker. <laughs> Jumping into our pistachio, this is made with that uh, phthalo green yellow shade, PG36, and the white. This is still maybe a little bit more blue than I would have expected phthalo green yellow shade to be. Um, uh-oh, 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 hold on, crisis. These colors really are so similar that I dipped my brush into the wrong one. Let's just see if we can cover that back up so that the integrity of this color remains true. Yeah, I do think having all three of these colors on my particular palette would be confusing. I think I'd probably go with the lightest and the darkest one so that there's the most variation but I haven't painted with them yet so I don't know. I also really like the sea foam green color and it's real pretty so maybe I would have the middle one and, and this lighter one but it is a question for future Denise who has seen all the colors. All right, um, this one is doing a weird thing. Let me smooth it back out. Okay. Next we have Cedar Leaf, which is PG50 and PB36. So that is going to be, um, in this case, it's a cobalt green, not a cobalt teal. And PB36 would be some version of that cerulean of which I am uncertain. Um, this is a very middle kind of Kelly green that is quite opaque. That opacity is going to be coming heavily, I imagine, from the cobalt green. Cobalt green is a really unique color, but it's one that I don't use very often, so I, I don't think I am an authority to speak on which it is useful for, but um, this is a, a bright middle green, if, if that's what you're looking for. Next is Summer Pear. That's what I wrote, Summer Pear. This is maybe a little bit uh, more intense than the pears that I eat are, uh, but it's a nice springy, I mean, there is a spring green that we're gonna be looking at next, but this is like a nice spring grass kind of green. 
Again, me giving the compliments to the colors I never use. First the oranges, now the bright greens. Those opaque colors just shook me. This one is made from PY74, so that's that middle Hansa yellow. Um, and then PB36 and PW6. So we're mixing a cerulean-ish green with a, I'm sorry, a cerulean blue, cerulean green is not a thing, with a middle yellow and a white to get this color. I really do feel in my soul that the opacity is, <sighs> it is swaying me into liking colors that I don't normally like. Okay, I'm going to try and get this last color before this little segment of my battery is up. Oh, I like this one. Okay, so I would normally call this color more of a spring green from other watercolor brands. This one's actually really nice. This is like an opaque, lighter sap green, like if you took sap green and added white to it. Um, and it's made from PY65, which is our middle yellow, uh, sorry, our warm yellow, and PG36, which is our thalo green yellow shade. Uh oh and uh our white i got some some paint in the other one i'll fix that let's get this last swatch down i think i'm just just barely gonna make it This reminds me of like a really bright, maybe with a bit of yellow added uh, chrome oxide green, which we are going to see next. So we'll see how it compares, but it does remind me of brands that have like brighter versions of that pigment. Oh my gosh, this, this swatch is a mess. Okay, we've got our third palette here. I skipped the fluorescence in the other palette. We'll come back to those. Um, but this is our earth tones and greens and blacks and grays. Um, we're going to finish up our greens here. I am painting them a little bit of out of order from what the website lists them as. They do go straight into like the earth tones and put these earthy greens a little bit later. But I just wanted to put all the greens together so I could see them. So this is our chrome oxide green. Um, exactly as I would expect it to be. And we can see a bit of a difference with the one up here. It's drying uh, and you can see that yellow kind of separating out of it, but they're, they're not super far off. So if we took a little bit of yellow and added it to this color, we'd get something kind of similar to that. Um, this is a naturally opaque pigment. Uh, this pigment is in my Embrace Opacity watercolor palette. Um, so it just has a natural tendency to be opaque without adding white, which is real handy for gouache. We're also going to get to see um, Florentine Green as a gouache color, which I'm interested uh, about as a concept. <laughs> My favorite thing about, uh, about Florentine Green is the granulation. So in gouache, where that's not as important, I'm wondering if the hue is going to make it still worthwhile to keep on a palette or if I'm just going to be wishing that it was, you know, the watercolor version. So let's see here. It does have a really pretty olive color in the pan. I'm nervous. Okay. <gasps> okay. I take back all my hesitations. It's so pretty. Um, this is a very desaturated green, obviously. Um, I still think don't want to use the word I'm thinking about using. Um, <laughs> I would still rather have the watercolor version because it's so pretty. 
Um, and if this was like a finite supply of this pigment, I would want to save it all and be greedy and keep it for my watercolors. However, it is a gorgeous color. Um, and I could see this being incredibly useful in landscapes for gouache, just like Florentine green is helpful in landscapes for uh, watercolor. So I can't say that it's a waste. It's still beautiful. I love this deep color. I love that it's desaturated and a little bit closer to black. Beautiful. All right, then we have sage green, which is another one I'm really excited for. This in the pan, it looks exactly like a fuzzy little sage leaf. Um, absolutely beautiful. Uh, a bit bubbly. It's bubbly in the pan, which a couple of the other colors have also been bubbly in the pan, but it's also bubbly on the paper. So, um, I'm not sure if that was just the way that I reactivated it. It looks like it's smoothing out a little bit now, so should be okay. So yeah, like a, a sage leaf or an agave plant. This is made with PG-17 and PW-6-1, so that's going to be your titanium uh, buff. So I don't know which of the PG-17s were used from it. If it was, if it was a regular titanium, titanium white in this color, I would, I would lean towards the more muted version. However, since we have that kind of off-white color from the titanium buff, Either of these greens could have been used. I, I don't know specifically which one was used to make that one, but it's beautiful. Then our last green is going to be olive green. This is uh, like a green olive from a can. So kudos to them for, for nailing that color name. This is made from PG-17 and PY-43. So that's going to be one of those two chrome oxide or florentine mixed with the yellow ochre type of color. Um, it's kind of transparent, which is interesting. Um, you can get yellow ochres that are quite opaque. And it appears that perhaps they used a less opaque version. trying to work up as thick of a mixture as I can on here so that I'm not diluting it too much. Not the most opaque version, but it's a, a nice natural yellow green color. And now we move into our earth tones. The first color is Prairie Moon, which is a cream color. I am really worried that I have green paint still on my brush. I'll just make sure I'm accurately representing this color. I feel like both the color name is accurate. It could have also been called cream and been accurate. Um, it's a very pale, um, it's kind of like yellowy. This yellow is still stained my fingers so bad. Uh, it's kind of like this yellowy off-white color. That is made from the PY43 and PW6 again. And the next we have Wheat Field, which is PBR24, which is um, our Naples Yellow Deep, which is the next color mixed with white. 
So this version is going to be even more opaque, um, but softer. And this is kind of like a, it's giving me like very retro yellow vibes. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Um, I haven't mentioned the time yet in this video. My patrons know I often record live audio in the middle of the night because that's when I have to. <laughs> uh, I live in an area with a lot of construction and a lot of neighbor noises. So uh, my Patreon tutorials also have to be recorded in the middle of the night if I'm talking through a tutorial step by step. And a video like this has to be recorded late at night. So it is almost 3 a.m. and I am a night owl, but this is, you know, reaching my usefulness uh, capacity. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I can still make sense for these last colors. Uh, I have Naples Yellow Deep in my Embrace Opacity palette. I love this in Stone Grounds watercolor line, so I'm going to love it here as well. This is a very kind of mustardy yellow type of color made from PBR24. It's a, it's a bright mustard yellow. It's not quite as dull as, as some mustard yellows can be, but it's very pretty. And then next we have Golden Ochre which is that PY43. Now there are a lot of versions of PY43, so maybe this is the version they use for their other colors that we've mentioned so far. Maybe it's not. I would assume probably because it's part of the same line that this would be the same color. And here we go. We can see that it's not quite as transparent as like its neighbor. Maybe it helped lend a bit of transparency to this olive green here. This is a little bit more brown than the Naples Yellow Deep. I haven't decided how I feel about these more transparent colors yet. Um, I would have to use them in a painting. My initial thoughts, and you know I love my yellow ochres, my initial thoughts though are that the colors that are more transparent and gouache are a little bit less desirable for me personally, just because if I'm going to use a more transparent color, I'd rather use a watercolor formula. This is, these aren't gummy formulas by any means, but this feels less creamy than the other ones do, if that makes sense. So it's fine, but if I were picking between these for a gouache palette specifically, I would probably pick up the Naples Yellow Deep. And then I already know I love the Raw Sienna Warm Shade. I'm sure I'm going to love it in this gouache as well. And that would just mean we all know I already love the raw sienna warm shade. So if I was going to pick two of these for my palette, which I often pick multiple uh, earth yellows, I would go with the two on either side and leave off the one in the middle. But if you were the opposite and only wanted one, I could see why you'd want one in between. But let's see what the raw sienna warm shade looks like. I do love that many of my favorite, um, my favorite earth tones as of late are in, <laughs> are in the gouache line, um, because there aren't a ton of earth colors here. Uh, but since I have been gravitating more towards opaque colors, a lot of the colors that I already use in watercolor did show up in this line, which is really fun to see. So this is the Ross Sienna warm shade. It's such a beautiful color. 
like honestly and the watercolor it's one of my favorites here it's beautiful it's not as opaque as the maple's yellow deep but it is more opaque than the yellow ochre i'm sorry the golden ochre But again, all of this just, you know, it's not going to be a substitute for painting with them in an actual painting. I often find favorites when I start painting that I didn't think I'd like as much as they are. Specifically, um, you guys have seen my preferences change for my dark browns over the years. I love the hues of like a burnt umber, the warmness of that color, but uh Raw umber is way more useful in, in animal paintings. I use that color way more often than I use my warm burnt umber these days. I messed up the swatch again as well, so I'm just trying to fix that. Okay. And then we have Mars Orange, which is going to be PY42, but this is a very orange version of that earth yellow. Should be pretty dang opaque. It's a very opaque color, naturally. I love it, no surprises. Then we have Burnt Sienna Crimson made from PBR7. I'm curious to see how opaque this is. It's not a super opaque color on its own in watercolor, but looks like we got some nice particle sizes in here because that is, that is lovely. Nice, rich, warm brown color. It's not as opaque as the Mars orange, but few things are. <laughs> it's got that beautiful red undertone. I'm, I mean, I'd have to get it out side by side. I might like this better than the watercolor version of this same pigment and name. And then finally we have, uh, for the earth reds anyway, we have India red, which should be nice and opaque. This is PR 101. We're not going to be able to see this name after we're done with it. So pretty. Again, I could find uses for both of these colors on my palette, but most people might opt to choose one or the other. And so if you're going to choose one or the other, I would say go with the Burnt Sienna if you want something a little, a little bit more opaque and a little bit more brown. And if you want something more opaque and more red, you'd go with the India Red. There is a hair on this wash that I want to take off, but... Feel like I'm gonna ruin it if I do that so I'm gonna leave it alone <laughs> okay y'all we're getting there we're getting there do I sometimes regret my need to swatch my paints yes accurate <laughs> um, turn this a little bit my shoulders are burning all right we've got um Raw Umber Dark Neutral here. So if you remember from my swatch with me, oopsie doopsies. Hold please. 
concentration needed. Okay, uh, from my stone ground swatch with me video for the watercolors, um, they have two versions in watercolors. They're both gorgeous. Uh, and I did say that I use the green shade more in watercolors because again, that cooler undertone is really helpful. Um, but this actually, it's gorgeous for one. It's opaque. It's, I, I feel like it's pretty cool if we don't have the other green to compare it to or the other, other brown to compare it to that has a little bit more green undertones. It's really, really pretty. And I'm impressed by how opaque these PR, uh, PBR sevens are. I'm almost done, kitten. Cricket is saying it is after three. It is time for bed. She has the best internal clock. It's kind of uncanny how well she can tell the time, given that we haven't seen the sun in many, many hours. <laughs> and there are studio lights on, but she knows it is three o'clock and it is time for bed. Next, we have Payne's Gray, which is an interesting mixture. It's PB, oops, I dipped into the wrong color. It's PBR7 and PB29, which is quite similar to uh, a lot of people's grays that they mix. It's the same two pigments in Jane's Gray. However, this version uh, appears to have way more blue in it. Payne's Gray is not normally made from these two colors um, from most brands, but I already love this hue. Um, I think this is a really gorgeous um, option instead of the Delft Cobalt Blue over here. I know it's hard to see in the frame right now. They're different, but they're similar. And I definitely like it more than the um, Starry Night on first glance. I mean, again, this is all subject to painting with them and seeing what's useful, but the texture seems better. Um, again, this is from someone who likes <laughs> opacity, so I can absolutely see the Stormy Night having more purpose on someone who likes more transparent colors. Sorry, I said Stormy Night. I think I, think I said that uh, it's Starry Night. This is gorgeous. I can't wait to paint with it. I wonder if they used this darker brown for this mixture. I don't, I don't know, but it's a very rich hue for what these colors would normally mix if you used a burnt sienna in watercolor with a, an, an ultramarine. This seems more rich than that. And this is mellowing out to that warmer shade. So I take back what I said. This is certainly that warmer shade uh, versus the green, but it's still really nice. Okay, we've, we're doing the rambling. We're almost there. We're almost done with our main gouache colors. And then we have some fluorescence that we're going to be working on. This is Iron Oxide Black. Probably not gonna be able to see any of this once we're done with it. This is a granulating black in watercolors. It'll be doing less of that in gouache. And then we also have a lamp black if we prefer. I'm curious in what in gouache how these differ. My first guess is that the PBK 11 might be a little bit more warm, but I'm not certain yet. This is PBK 10, which is actually different than most lamp blacks. I believe lamp black is usually P10 
PBK six. Oh no. I started painting another big black square again instead of <laughs> grading it. Kitten, if you could wait to groom yourself for like 10 more minutes, I would really, really appreciate it. We're almost done and you're just so loud about it. Hopefully I can cut out that audio so you don't have to listen to the lips smack it smacking. Uh oh. I got a big smear across this swatch, but luckily we're putting a gray there, so it should be all right. Next up is our titanium gray that I told you about. Um, I don't know if this is a different version than the one that they use in their watercolors. I believe, uh, unless I'm misremembering or it's changed since the last time I looked, I believe that their watercolor version is listed as PBK 19 without a colon. Um, and this one is PBK 19 colon seven, and it is the version that they use for all of their gouache mixes with this pigment in it. So I don't know if that's a difference between the gouache and watercolor or if they're both that. Try not to dip into that color above so that it doesn't bleed into this swatch. Um, this is like the perfect kind of elephant gray type of color. It's a little bit on the warmer side, but it's, you know, pale and muted. Then we're going to have titanium buff. This is uh, a warmer version uh, of kind of these neutral tones. This one is made with PB6 colon one. You'll find that in pretty much every brand that offers this pigment. sure do hope this is useful information for you. Since we're nearing the end of the video, let me know what you thought of this style if you haven't already. If you like the hang out with me for however long we've been recording uh, style with me yammering on about things that I should have probably shut up a long time ago about. Uh, or if you prefer the more concise videos, I know that some people do prefer the more concise videos so that they can save on some time. Other people like to leave something on while you're working. So I'd love to hear from both audiences. Um, this is titanium white made from PW6. And I will just say that even when I am doing watercolor paintings, I use fresh white gouache for highlights. So I don't know how helpful this will be, um, aside from like maybe mixing some pastel colors. But for any highlights, I would still prefer to use a white fresh from the tube. Um, it's such a um, such an, a ubiquitous color that unless you really want a brand specific palette with only one brand on it, then I might not recommend. It's kind of like when we were talking about our handmade choices from the watercolor line. And I mentioned that like, if you want a brand specific palette that has all your staples on it, then absolutely go for some staples. But um, if I have a limited amount of money from a certain, you know, that I can spend on a certain brand, I tend to want to choose the more unique colors. And this is not a unique color. So um, it's there if you need it your money is probably better spent on a tube of fresh gouache. And then finally, something you don't see from me very often on this channel, or maybe ever, is some fluorescent paint. <laughs> uh, 
absolutely not in my wheelhouse, but I am excited to take a look at it because I don't ever use these colors, but I've gotten really into sketchbooking lately, so maybe it would be something that I could utilize these days that I wouldn't have had use for before. Um, I can't imagine ever choosing to paint a color with uh, painting with these colors. For me personally, it's just not my style. Um, however, I am excited to like play with them in a sketchbook. So these are all made out of fluorescent dyes. They are not light fast. Um, and so these are just for fun colors. Um, and because I am so out of the loop with fluorescents, I would love for you to let me know how you use them. If they are something that you paint with often, if they're just fun sketchbook colors, if you actually use them mixing with other, um, paints in your watercolor palette or gouache palette. Uh, these are probably mostly going to be transparent because they're dyes, not pigments, and clearly has a better use case over white than on black since it's not going to be opaque. I don't think this is going to come across on the camera because of how fluorescents work, but this is highlighter yellow, absolutely highlighter yellow. Um, we will do a gradient here just in case we find anything fun as we dilute it. it It's literally like you spilled a highlighter onto your paper, <laughs> which I'm sure for most is like fine and normal. I just don't use fluorescent colors, so this is uh, fun to see. All right, next we have Noble Orange. This is gonna be our bright orangey orange color. We kind of have a rainbow here of different fluorescents, but there's a heavier emphasis on the reds and pinks. I'm looking in the viewfinder and this just looks like a normal orange. It is absolutely highlighter yellow, or uh, highlighter orange. It is so bright. The faces I am making are probably amusing. <laughs> All right. I wonder if there's any chance that I can like edit this after the fact, uh, in like post-processing to to make this show up. I'm sure I'll put a note on the screen and let you know if it's accurate or not, but oh my gosh, <laughs> it's hurting my eyes. It's too late for this color. Too late at night. Um, this color doesn't do the best job at grading off. So just throwing that out there. It's a bit patchy or a lot patchy. I'm going to stop messing with it. <laughs> then we have Atomic Orange, which looks more red in the pan, so we'll see how it paints out. My gosh, this in the camera, in the viewfinder, this looks like a, like a regular warm yellow. <laughs> so hopefully I can fix that in post-processing. Okay. Uh, this atomic orange is like a fluorescent warm red. I'm almost done, kitten. You gotta wait. I'm so sorry. We've got six more colors after this, okay? I promise it won't take that long. We're going to try a little bit harder to get a smooth gradient without backtracking here. Still, still not super, super smooth. You can definitely see more pigment here, but if I mess with it, it's just going to make it worse. So we're going to leave it alone. 
Then we have hydrogen red. I think what I remember hearing in a video is that it's very hard to find an actual red fluorescent color. So I don't know how this compares to other offerings. Um, it's I don't know how I would describe this. I, yes, it's a red. It still looks a little bit on the orangier side to me than like a, a true middle red. Yes, kitten, I know. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a ton to say about this. I don't know how to use these colors. Um, I I don't know. I don't I don't want to play favorites and least favorites with colors that I don't know anything about. Um, I kind of weirdly like this orange, even though I don't normally like orange. It's fun. Okay, next we have helium pink, which looks like a very bright opera rose, like really, really, really bright opera rose. Holy camoly. I feel like some people that I've watched on YouTube and have commented on YouTube who love these bright pinks. Again, it's so hard and I apologize that I don't have the basis for like being able to compare these because I don't use a lot of these fluorescent colors. I don't use a lot of operas, um, even though I know that they can be handy. I understand um, and I don't have a whole lot to compare this to, but this is easily the brightest version of this rose color that I have personally seen. Um, hopefully the scans at least will do a better job at kind of showing those off. Um, they are impressive. <laughs> I will say that much. Uh, it might be really fun to like play with an underpainting of this color. I've seen people do like pink underpaintings um, and it would be a challenge, like a fun challenge to see what I would do with this as an underpainting. just so far out of my normal wheelhouse. Okay, I know I just said I wasn't gonna play favorites and least favorites with colors I don't use, but that one's my favorite so far. <laughs> Very pretty. Okay, we still have Radiant Magenta. So we have a pink and a magenta and a violet coming up. Last little bit of our page here, oh, Interesting. Okay, so this is probably more of what an opera rose typically looks like, I would guess. Yeah, I think this is the opera rose color, and this is something else. <laughs> Much more bright. So uh, if you are a collector of fluorescent pinks, might be fun to check them out. Honey, you have to stop jumping on me. I'm so sorry. I'm not done yet. You want me to be able to buy you food? Because I have to work to do that. All right. These colors definitely don't move in water. Like, they will pretty much stay where you put them. And that does make it hard to get a gradient. Because in a gradient, I would normally, like, pull color throughout a wash. Just do our best to soften it off there. Okay, well, now I don't know, because I like this one, too. They're both really cool. 
This one has a lot of water on the swatch and I'm concerned that it's going to back run. Let me see if I can pick that up. I didn't finish that sentence. My apologies. <laughs> and by doing that, I just put more water onto our gradient. So now that's going to get ruined, but oh well. All right, three more colors. We have violet, blue, and green. So this violet, again, is a very warm shade uh, of our fluorescent colors. Um, I'm not getting quite as much pigment on this one. Uh, not pigment, dye. <laughs> not technically pigment. I'm not getting as much paint, that is what I meant to say. Um, and this is ultraviolet. Oh, it's just ultraviolet. There should be no period here. So uh, just to confirm that it's not like ultramarine violet, uh, it is ultra space violet. There shouldn't be the period. So that makes sense. Um, hello paints. I separated you for a reason. Please don't communicate with your neighbors. There's a bunch of blue paint that has worked its way over onto the violet via the little clampies on the <laughs> on the palette itself. Oops, I picked up blue. Um, so I guess we're gonna end this video like we started and me skipping <laughs> skipping a square. This is uh, more opaque than the other ones are. It's called Argan Blue. Not as fluorescent as the other colors that we've seen. It is really bright, but if you didn't tell me that there was a fluorescent in this, I might just think it was like a really bright phthalo blue color. So take that for what you will. It's more of a middle blue than phthalo blue is. Like it's not quite as green leaning, but wow. Wow, kitten. She's been waiting at my feet and wanting me to stop. And she went to walk away and she just walked across a bunch of papers even though the whole rest of the floor doesn't have anything on it. She just wanted me to know that she's upset about it. Yes, I see you and I am talking about you. That is my desk. How can I help you? Okay, I'm trying to get the blue off the top of my ultraviolet so we can do the gradient. You know, you have food in the other room that is waiting for you. I know you think it's not there because I am here, but that's not how that works. Welcome to the Denise talks to her cat. In the middle of the night episode, I feel like this is still contaminated with blue. Please hold. I want to make sure I'm giving you an accurate swatch. Let me try that again. It's a little better. Oh my gosh. Okay, I can't paint anymore. I'm a useless little bean. And our last color is proton green. Back to very clearly fluorescent.
All right, so as we kind of finish this up, again, I can't be an authority on these colors because I don't use them. Um, and would love to hear from all of you. I don't know that I understand the point of a fluorescent gouache. I don't know why it's not just watercolor. Um, I can definitely tell that there's an attempt to make them opaque, but they're not opaque. So I'm wondering if there is a benefit to this kind of thicker consistency over watercolors, um, or if watercolors wouldn't look good with these pigment, uh, these dyes. Um, I'm just really curious because it's not something I deal with very often. So let me clean up my workspace a little bit. Um, and Okay, while that other sheet is drying, um, I'm going to show you one of the sheets for like peeling off all the tape and then I'm just going to let that other one dry naturally. I don't know what happens to fluorescence if you try it and dry them with a heat tool and I would rather not find out. Um, so <laughs> we'll just do the one sheet and then I will put scan, scanned images up uh, at the end of this video for you. And if you'd like to see the full version in high resolution, um, you can head on over to Patreon where there will be a companion post. So I hope that those are helpful. Again, totally first impressions, haven't done any paintings, but I hope that if you're looking at these paints and interested in purchasing one, that perhaps these comparisons help to narrow down some of the choices that are very similar to each other. There's a reason why this part is always edited out of the video. All right, I was worried that the Sharpie had blood under the tape and it did, which is a bummer because it's not going to be as clean and pretty, but oh well. I'm wondering how many people just clicked off of the video because this isn't going to be as satisfying as I hoped it would be, but we can still get some cleaner lines. So the reason that I intentionally kind of made this smaller than the size of the paper is I have a really hard time fitting this on my scanner's scan bed. Um, so that's why I left a little bit of space. Again, I'm sorry for the bleeding. Uh, it's not as pretty as they usually are, but hopefully it is still helpful. Um, so let's look over these again. I think my favorite yellow is that daffodil just because it's so unique, whereas the other colors, the other three yellows are available in watercolor. So this one is really, really nice um, for the novelty of it. Um, I don't know where I would personally use the peach. I'm not opposed to it, but it's probably one of my lesser favorites of the pastel colors. Um, I still love this color. This is, I believe, more opaque than the watercolor version. Then we have our assortment of reds. Um, I have a hard time even calling this one <laughs> an orange. It's really quite red. Um, so you've got your bright orange. You've got, I would call this like a scarlet. This is a very deep, deep, deep orange. Um, and then we have our reds. There is a lot of speckling on this one and this one and this one. Um, I am on the Arches paper and I know some people have issues with that uh, compared to other brands of paper. So it could just be an issue with that, but uh, it's only in the tints. So the ones where the heavy pigment is laid down, it's not as big of a problem. It is a little bit interesting because this is a middle red and so I would tend to pick that color for like the red on my palette, but knowing that it doesn't tint off well on Arches paper anyway um, would be a challenge. However, I could also try this on other paper like my sketchbook papers that I'm more likely to use gouache in um, and maybe this color is fine for that. It is the most opaque red of the bunch. We don't really have a true magenta. And again, that makes sense because it's a very, those are very transparent colors. So again, I'm guessing that that is the reason they didn't do it. I do love the Ch uh, Chinook salmon for kind of like this 
orangey pink and then I also love the rose garden this is a pink color it's just not like a mixing magenta this is the closest we have to a mixing magenta um, but it's still very much like a deep deep red we also have this rhubarb pie that I love it's super super pretty um there is a little bit of shininess in the mass tone but I like the way that it kind of separates a tiny bit in the the wet wash um, that's really pretty. The Saskatoon berry is gorgeous. It actually dried a lot deeper than it went down wet. So I am digging that color as well as like a, a warm purple. Also loving, I uh, can't see the names of these anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that was the Antique Rose. That was the antique rose. Okay, um, that one's really pretty if you want like a dusty pink. I don't think I would have used for water lily personally, but I can understand why someone might want it. Um, interesting. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at these kind of up close and there is like a, a lot of shine on the really heavy mass tone of our apple blossom. So that's something to watch for. It is very thick. Like I'm looking at the ridge of the paper and it's like there's a lot of paint there and it's not shiny on the other part of the swatch. So that would just be a like, don't put as much pigment down as I did. <laughs> um, and then what other notable colors do we have here? The Tyrian uh, purple and actually the Tyrian purple and the cobalt, uh, the Delft Cobalt Blue are very similar in the gouache line. They're they're similar colors otherwise, but they're I feel like they're more different in the watercolors, whereas they're very close together here. So as much as I love this color, and I'd probably between the two prefer the Cobalt, the Delft Cobalt Blue, um, having to replace that with the Tyrian Cobalt Purple is not the end of the world. Um, I like the hue of this color, but it did go down pretty patchy, so probably not for me for Starry Night. Um, as this ultramarine blue dried, it's not more opaque, but it is very vivid. Kitten, you have to stop putting your claws in my pants and getting stuck. Thank you. Um, then we have blue jay, which is kind of our more middle blue. That would be more of a mixing color. We've got this bluebell wood, which is kind of our periwinkle. Um, I think this is hard. I think between the two, I don't know which I'd pick. I guess technically, if you want to be really resourceful about it, this is um, ultramarine mixed with a white, so you could easily mix that, whereas there is an aphalo blue in the line, so this would be more of a range of color, um, but I might use this color more often, if that makes sense. It's Closer to a cerulean is my thought process there. Um, our cobalt ultramarine, this looks like a very similar, this is a very similar color to like the watercolor version. I love blue spruce, absolutely great. I know I said before that um, like if you're gonna choose between these three colors and you wanted like two of them, you might wanna go separate, but they're all so similar, honestly. I would just pick one of them. I don't think you need all three and I would probably, I like the Aurora Green the best, or the Pistachio. I think I could leave uh, Glacier Lake. So I'd pick one of these two if you want a yellower, kind of sagey green. There is a sage green, but like if you wanted a, a lighter green, we can go here. If you want a more blue green, we can go there. Um, I can't take the tape off this yet, but we can look over them real quick so you have my last thoughts. My last first thoughts, I guess. Um, I love, I love how this dried the cedar leaf. It is very akin to a cobalt teal, a uh, cobalt green. So um, it's not too different from that, but it's really pretty. I wouldn't personally need either of these on my palette. Um, I think this one dried a little bit. They both dried a little bit patchy for my preference. I would rather have both of the PG-17s, um, which I could mix with yellows and get different range of greens. Uh, I love the sage green as well. Again, that is something like if I have titanium buff on my palette and I have the PG-17s, so I don't need a pan of it, but it's really pretty and I like it. Um, we have our olive green. That's nice. I don't think either of these are necessities. 
I would rather just have a Naples Yellow Deep. And oh, 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 this dried very dark. Um, this is way darker than the watercolor version is. Um, I just noticed that. So this is interesting. I think between these two colors, you could certainly get a wide range and you could mix either of those with white to get kind of these lighter values. Um, really hard time choosing between the earth reds. I like them all. I like them all. <laughs> That's the statement. I like them all. Unsurprisingly, they are different enough that I would prefer to have them all in my palette. But if you were just going to go with two of them, I would go with the Mars orange and the Indian red. If you were only going to go with one of them, I'd go with the burnt sienna crimson. Um, this is going to be a must. I think uh, to have a dark brown is like really important. The, this paint's gray did dry way more blue than I expected. Um, it's pretty vivid. So if you want like a really bright, not bright, if you want a really saturated shadow color, um, this would be a good choice, but it is, I would say more of a dark blue than it is a gray. Um, I also think I can stand by saying they're not the same, but they're similar. So if, if you're missing the Delft Cobalt Blue, try this one out. Um, then we have our two blacks. This one is a very flat matte black. Um, I do remember saying that the web, I do remember seeing that the website said that the lamp black was more intense than the iron oxide black. And in the watercolors, I didn't feel like that was true. I think that's what, oh, maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm going back on it. Anyway, I do think that the lamp black is much more potent. Uh, in the gouache. So here, this is a much softer black, and then this is a more heavy concentrated black. We do have our titanium gray, buff, and white. These are more, um, these are darker in the gouache than they are in watercolor, which is not surprising, uh, but it is something to know. I still think this would make a great color for an elephant. Um, again, the white isn't bad. I just, I would rather have a fresh tube of white myself. And then we have all of our neons that may or may not be showing up on your screen. These pinks are different enough that if you are a fan of pinks, I would recommend getting them both. This is closer to a rose. This is closer to a fluorescent highlighter pink. We've got our, this isn't, now I know what people are saying when I see this dry. This isn't a red. This is like a really bright coral orange reddish color, um, if that makes sense. This is orange. This is like a warm yellow and this is your cool yellow these look the least fluorescent out of the bunch i don't know if that's common for fluorescent colors where the warm colors look brighter but um yeah i hope that's helpful i'm excited to be able to peel off this tape when it's ready and you'll see some screenshots <laughs> I hope this was useful for you. Thank you for hanging out with me for a bit. Uh, thank you to Stone Ground for sending these paints. Uh, you're spoiling me and I really appreciate that. And I can't wait to use these in paintings. Uh, let us know what you think about the paints in the comments and if you would like to paint with them. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Thank you to my patrons for being amazing and supporting me. And we hope to see you over there. The Discord's been popping off lately. I'm really excited about our attempts to revive uh, that community and make sure everyone's like feeling comfy and cozy and chatty and like tons of tons of chatting in the Discord. So thank you guys for uh, engaging in that and being part of a community together. And uh, we would love to have more of you there. All right, I will see you in the next one. Have fun, bye. Wait, that's not what I say. Until next time, my friends, happy painting.